Hello, SJCAC and New Vine families. Good morning and good afternoon and happy new year. So glad that you could be with us on this first Sunday of 2021. And what an awesome reminder from the video that we just saw that as we enter into 2021, that may the Lord keep our eyes on his kingdom and that he has called us for kingdom living and kingdom purposes. So again, we wanna say welcome. Thank you for joining us from your homes today. As you know, today is our first Sunday of the year and of the month, and so we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper later during our service. If you haven't already yet prepared the elements, please do so now. And before we enter into a time of worship, I just wanted to highlight a few things for you, um, just a few reminders. We are entering into 40 days of prayer with the Greater Alliance family starting today. You should have received an email earlier this morning. This week, we are focusing on the holiness of God and all of God's attributes. And today's devotional was centered upon the eternalness of God. So I hope and pray that each one of you will wake up each day excited to seek the Lord's face together. Use the devotionals, use the scriptures, use the prayer points as we come humbly before our God and as we seek his face together as a church family, as, as a greater alliance body here in the U.S. The second thing I want to remind you about is um, this Friday, um, January 8th, is the last day to submit any uh, check request forms uh, for reimbursement. So if you had any expenses from last year, please make sure you get those forms completed and signed um, by the representative and then turn it into the church office by this Friday so that we can reimburse you properly. And the last thing that I want to tell you about is to save the date, January 23rd, we'll be celebrating Pastor Yo Ping Liu of our Manual Congregation. He will be ordained that day on Zoom. So that is a Saturday, January 23rd at 1030. Please mark your calendars and more information will be forthcoming. Before we begin our time of worship through singing and prayer, uh, song, we are going to, I'm just going to lead us in a word of prayer as we start. God, we thank you for your presence here today in our homes, in our church sanctuary, even as we're live streaming. Father, we ask that you would come and fill us, God, with your love, fill us with your presence, fill us with your joy as we enter this new year with you. Jesus, we know that you are in control. We know, God, that you are on your throne, that we know, Lord, that you love and care for each one of us. So, Father, we pray that as we come to you and sing your praises and declare your worth today, that, God, you would be enthroned, that, Lord, you would be celebrated, and, God, that you would be speaking to our hearts this morning and this afternoon. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning and, or good afternoon. SJCC and New Vine, let's sing this together. Let's start that over. Let's yeah. start that over.
God, there's no place we'd rather be than in your love and in your presence. I ask that today as we continue to worship, as we listen to testimonies and um, the message, that you would continue to manifest in us and that your presence would be with us everywhere we go because we just love to be in your presence, God. Thank you for this new year, um, this new season that is coming. And we ask that you would prepare our hearts for today and for the rest of this year. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning and good afternoon, church family. Happy New Year. Today we are here with two people that represent the young and the old. Ada gave me permission to call her old today, (laughs) who gave their yes to God, to give of their time, their energy, their resource, to step out of their comfort zone, to be on an incredible mission with God. Keaton, a young man in 10th grade. Many of you may know him, maybe some of you may not, but he doesn't come off to be a very loud and ambitious man. Many of you may think he's a quiet, shy uh, young man, but I have to tell you, I've known him ever since he was a baby, and he is a young man with a fierce passion for Jesus. And I, he's here today to share what he has been a part of uh, this past Christmas. On November 19th, Keaton wrote me an email with an unusual vision he received from the Lord. And I have to say that Keaton was a seed behind Healing Grove uh, Christmas event, the first of its kind and many more to come in the years ahead. Keaton, Can you share with our church family the vision you had? And how did you see this vision become a reality? What was asked of you to step out to see this vision come into reality? Okay, so I had a dream that me and all my friends at school were giving out gifts to uh, people in need. And uh, this actually happened uh, right after Operation Christmas Child. Um, It hadn't really occurred to me that, like, after all the years I've been at church, um, this Operation Christmas Child event hasn't gone past our, like, church boundaries. Like, all our gifts and all our boxes were being packed by our church community. And I felt like this uh, opportunity to give to uh, people in need should be available to, like, everyone and, like, not just our church. So, um... This actually became uh, real on December 18th with our first ever Healing Grove uh, outreach. Um, During that event, I saw like many people. I saw uh, other people bring their friends from school and just in general, a lot of people I didn't know, which was really good because I was able to work with people, uh, everyone uh, to uh, give to people, which was really cool. Awesome. So when we planned this, um, Healing Grove sent out a quick Facebook uh, announcement. And within two to three hours, about 175 families came and registered over 400 kids. And so we had this almost impossible uh, mission to try to get 400 plus gifts uh, to bless that community. And I have to say within two weeks, we, we received close to 500 gifts 
um, from our church, but that one Sign Up Genius link traveled to many homes and many generous donors. So Keaton, as you've, you were there from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. that day, you saw hundreds of people come by, you saw many volunteers come by. What would you say that you learned about God and about yourself through uh, that day? Um, for me, um, God can do anything. Um, I didn't know that just one simple dream could bless over 500 people. I thought I needed like months to plan this, but you know, I just had the right connections. I had prayer and it worked out. And for I, for myself, I just learned that if you ever have a dream like of anything, like you should never keep it to yourself because like you never know that it could actually bless multiple people one day. Thank you, Keaton, for being brave to share that dream, but also working your butt off to see it happen. So we're so proud of you. Thank you. I'm gonna turn to the next generation, uh, many generations ahead of Keaton, who gave her yes. Um, Ada, back in the end of November, a small idea, a seed was birthed through Healing Grove to host a three-week mission trip. Time was click, uh, ticking because there were millions of dollars that uh, we needed to access to uh, provide rental assistance for the low-income families. And so Ada and many of you, um, I know that Maria, Wilson, Mark, Audrey, Michelle, Elizabeth, and many others who could not take time off of work, you were here providing food, coffee, uh, hospitality. And uh, about 30 people from our church and many neighboring churches gathered for three weeks to process uh, 300 applications, actually 299, right? The goal was 300. They accomplished processing 299 applications. One application takes about six to eight hours to process. And uh, we wanna give thanks to the Lord because out of the 299 applications, that equates to 536 adults, 420 children, accessing $1.9 million, which translates to about $6,500 for each family to pay rent. So you, Ada, gave your yes to the Lord, and I know you had a lot of challenges and inconveniences in giving that yes to him. I want you to share how the church family, when we walk in unity and love, with the power of the Holy Spirit can climb any wall and any mountain. Could you share your experience with the three-week mission trip? Yes, um, you know, I think like being obedient to God always requires us to have courage to overcome our challenges, our oppositions. So when Pastor Ted invited um, us at a Wednesday prayer meeting to join the SEP mission trip, SEP stands for COVID Emergency Homelessness Prevention Program. I sense the Holy Spirit prompt in my heart to respond yes. But then I was struggle with some deterrence. First thing is the next day my brother had to admit it to emergency room and he required more of my time to care for him. And then I was struggle about, struggling about the thought whether I want to expose myself to COVID at my age. Uh, I'm over 60, and so uh, it will be a high risk. And also whether I can um, set aside all my other commitments and reserve three weeks of my time to do this volunteer work. So at TWA time, you know, Proverb um, 28 and 29 kept speaking to me. So he said, those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eye to them receive many curse. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. So I decide to just obey God and set aside my personal inconvenience. So at the mission trip, I face other challenges. You know, I've been out of the workforce for four years since retirement, and I thought that I know how to work with a computer and how to work on the Google Sheet, but it shocked me that I realized that 
the technology has advanced so fast, so much that all what I knew has become obsolete. So I was like the most low-tech person in the team who required a lot of coaching. And on top of that, I actually uh, have hearing loss on my right ear, and um, I had a hard time hearing people. You know, I rely a lot on lip reading. But now everybody speak to a mask that took away my visual cue. And also wearing a mask all day, it not only make me feel stuffy, it also make my eyeglass blurry from the steam coming out of my own breath. And, you know, I was not productive or helpful to the team in the first week. You know, the tech savvy team member like Maria, Michelle, Audrey, they were so kind and so patient with my slow learning. So by the second week, I was not much a burden for the team anymore. But then the team hit with a scare that five of our team members were out because they were infected with COVID. And I was concerned whether we will have more team members left because um, that would limit our ability to accomplish our goal. So, um, through the mission chief, what I learned is God showed me it's not about what we can offer, but it's about how God can work through our obedience. You know, I um, only need to make myself available, and he just took me on a ride of seeing his faithfulness and his sovereignty. At the end of the um, trip, we were able to process 299 applications, and I had the experience working with a team of amazing, wonderful people. We work extremely um, seamlessly together in unity without any conflict. And even though we are so diverse in our cultural and ethical differences. So, you know, um, the, the SEP mission is, is um, a joint partnership among 21 agencies. And uh, Healing Grow processed half of the 1,000 applications, and the other 20 agencies process the other half. It's not because we are better or smarter than them, but because we have the Holy Spirit in us. And with the Holy Spirit in us, we can scale the wall, we can move mountain. So um, I learned about trusting God for his sovereignty. And so overall, you know, the STEP program has helped 1,000 low-income family um, to stay away from uh, being homelessness. But there are still about over 13,000 more poor people, poor uh, household, that were, are still in debt. In debt of about 113 uh, millions. So this seems like a huge need. You know, but um, with God, you know, we can move mountain. So I, you know, by the end of January, this family will be at risk to be uh, homeless when the eviction ban is expired. So, um, you know, I just want to challenge each one of you. Will you set aside your challenges or your, or your uh, oppositions and join the movement of eradicating powerlessness um, a homelessness or poverty 
in the uh, very low income people. Thank you, Ada. It's truly a remarkable testimony how when you give your God your yes, no matter how young, old, inexperienced, with a mask, without a mask, uh, in the prime of the year during Christmas, um, both of you gave your yes to Jesus. And so church family, I wanna encourage and challenge you today. Will you give God your yes? No matter how old, young, inexperienced, whatever challenges or walls that you may face, we do have a community right in our backyard neighborhood that is facing uh, some difficult challenges in the months ahead. And if God is prompting something in your heart, it can be something small like a vision of giving gifts to children or giving time. That little C can be part of uh, the bigger mission that God is inviting our church, is inviting you to be a part of. So I just wanna bless you that this year you would start this Sunday giving God your yes to whatever he places on your heart. It is not too small uh, to ask of the Lord as you give your yes. Thank you, Ada and Keaton, for sharing your amazing testimony. Happy New Year again, and happy 2021. Uh, let's just, there are just a few of us here. Let's just shout out together, whether you're at home or sitting here, let's say together, happy 2021. Ready? One, two, three. Happy 2021. Uh, if you have been hearing from the Lord, and if we've seen anything uh, in these last few weeks, God is reminding us that the kingdom of God is on the move. The church has been on the move. Church is on mission. And even if we haven't been able to gather together, the Lord has given us an incredible opportunity uh, to really shine uh, in this world, in this season. So let's pray as we open up and as we enter into this brand new year, 2021, let's pray that God will grant us more opportunities to really be the church uh, in this uh, very unprecedented time of our, our life. Uh, it was so great to see you uh, two days ago. Uh, it was 290 days since we were able to gather together to worship, and uh, many of you came out on January 1st to have our first corporate worship, and just to hear your voice, the singing and, and fellowship was so awesome. And I just cannot wait till we get to do that in person again. Uh, but I don't know if you have any New Year tradition, uh, New Year resolution. The things that we do uh, on a regular basis, as a, as a Korean uh, family, uh, we have a very particular tradition. I don't know about you, but uh, for Koreans, you have to have this rice cake soup on the New Year's Day. So sure enough, uh, on the first, uh, January 1st, uh, Sandy got up and made this delicious rice cake soup. And that kind of marks you actually add on one year to your age. So if you have not eaten that as a Korean, uh, you actually don't age or you don't move on. Uh, so that's the tradition. But after that, uh, we have this bowing ceremony. You know, we gather together as a family and we bow to our elders and the elders will actually have to give a little bit of allowance money, depending on your age. Uh, if, if you're old enough, then you actually give money to your parents. So we go through this elaborate bowing ceremony, and we actually did that as a whole family uh, with our cousins and with our in-laws. Uh, and then they sent, this year, they sent their bank account or Zelle account. So we're doing everything online. Uh, but this is really a way of blessing our next generation. And then, the highlight of this ceremony is at the end of the day that the elders actually sit with their next generation, their children, grandchildren, and speak blessing over them. And this has really been the highlight, the, the most treasured tradition of our, our New Year's Day celebration. Uh, just this past week, uh, one of our spiritual mentors, uh, he really wanted to bless our girls. So he set up a time and we did a Zoom call and uh, for almost an hour, he spoke blessing over every single child, 
praying over them, laying hands on them, each of them. It was such a meaningful time, and this is really one of the highlights for me uh, as we celebrate this new year. Uh, what I would like to do today, I thought about how to really open up this brand new year, 2021, and uh, the Lord really gave me the desire to speak, to pronounce blessing over the church, over each one of you. In fact, uh, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is actually what's known to us as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in the very beginning of the sermon, Jesus begins by pronouncing eight sayings, what's known to us as Beatitudes. So uh, if you have it in front of you, let's go ahead and uh, uh, open your Bible. Uh, if we have that on the screen, let's go ahead and read it together. I'm going to turn around here. Uh, starting from verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, here, Jesus actually speaks eight blessings or blessed things. He begins his sermon not by giving eight commandments or eight rules to follow, but instead he pronounces blessing uh, over his disciples. Now, the blessings that are recorded in these few verses, two are the same. The first and the last is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and then there are six in between. Uh, expressed in divine comfort, the inheritance of the earth, abundant life, the promise of his mercy, the promise of his face, we shall see God, and the gift of sonship and daughterhood. And again, it ends with the promise of the kingdom of heaven. Now, there are, there are something that is very unique about these blessings. Uh, there's actually some sort of condition for each of these promises or these blessings that Jesus is pronouncing. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the persecuted. Now, what's more troubling in this beatitude or this teaching is that many of these things that Jesus is pronouncing over his disciples, these are the things that we live to avoid in life. Who would want to live in poverty? Who wants to mourn? Who wants to experience hunger or thirst or even suffering and persecution? These are not what we would actually consider as blessing. Imagine on this New Year's Day, I bless you. I bless you with poverty in 2021. I bless you to cry every single day of this year. I bless you to be persecuted. Do you feel blessed? Now, if you really take what Jesus is saying to our heart, it's really hard to take in because these are not what we would really consider as blessing in this life. If I were to say those words over you, you would hate me for that, right? Instead, what we want, what we consider blessing in this life is things like prosperity, health, and safety, security. So how do we make sense of these sayings, these eight sayings or eight beatitudes? These are not just eight random blessings. I want us to really have a different understanding. I, you know, I really spent time meditating on this, and I've come to realize and discover that these eight sayings of Jesus are actually the stages of our spiritual growth as a child of God. These eight things that are listed here, it's actually how we grow into the kingdom of God as, as those who belong, who possess the blessings of the kingdom of God. They're not actually conditions or requirements to get the blessing. They're actually the blessing in and of themselves. 
You don't become poor by choice. Uh, you cannot make yourself mourn, or you cannot make yourself hungry or thirsty. Meekness, mercy, purity are not something that you can achieve. They're actually the qualities, inner qualities of, or the conditions of our inner being, who we are as a person. So Jesus is not saying that you become poor and then you'll get these blessings or you'll get the kingdom. You do this and then you'll get that. That's not what he's saying here. And we're going to quickly uh, go through, re review each of these characteristics uh, of the blessed. And I want you to really see where you are today in terms of your own growth or your own spiritual maturity uh, as we look at the, this passage once again. Now, the first thing Jesus is saying our spiritual growth actually begins with poverty in our spirit. You know, our flesh, our sinful nature is naturally inclined to fill ourselves. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. We want good things in life. We want to satisfy the longings of our flesh, our appetite, our passion, fun, pleasures of this world. And yet, Jesus is saying that once you experience the goodness of the kingdom of God. Once you taste what the kingdom of heaven is like, you actually begin to lose appetite for the things of this world. This is really true. You know, Abigail just turned 18 today. Uh, I know she's sitting here and she might feel embarrassed, but just to give an example, you know, uh, all these months she got into real uh, skateboarding, so she actually borrowed one of her friend's skateboard. It was actually a handmade skateboard, and then she's been practicing on it. And uh, for her 18th birthday, Sandy and I decided to get her a real skateboard. Not that the other one was not real, but Sandy researched and got the best skateboard that we could get, and then we were hoping that she would actually take it to her college and, and ride it to school. But this skateboard was so nice when she got it. We all got on it, and it was just, it rode so smooth. And we realized that she's been riding on a piece of junk. I even was able to ride on this new board. And then, now that she's really experienced what a good skateboard is, that she would probably never go back to the old one. This is just an example of how we come to realize, we come to taste and experience something that is extraordinary and, and something that is so good, we would never want to go back to those things. You know, when I first came to America, I thought McDonald's was probably the most quintessential great American cuisine. And I remember every Sunday, my, our family tradition was to go out and get two Big Macs and fries. But once you taste the real good food, you would never go back to McDonald's. I, we don't eat McDonald's at home anymore. The same is the, uh, such is the kingdom of God. Uh, the real blessing is that you get to experience and taste the goodness of God, and then you don't want anything else. The second blessing here is that Jesus says that we become mourners. What Jesus is saying is that we begin to develop godly sorrows. We're not just talking about worldly sorrows or pain or brokenness that we experience in life. Jesus is specifically talking about our relationship to the world. If you're born again, if you have a different nature inside of you, you begin to see the world differently. As you see injustice around you, as you see the suffering and brokenness around us, you're actually able to mourn and grieve. This is really the part of God's divine nature that he wants us to partake. You know, it's so easy, especially in this day and age, it's so easy to get angry at injustice we see. But the question is, who can actually mourn and weep over the world that we live in? Who can cry over our city or over the souls of men and women around us? This, Jesus says, is actually a blessing because we get to partake in this God's divine sorrow. And the promise is that God will comfort those who mourn with him. So that is the second blessing. The third, he says, blessed are the meek. Now, most people would understand this word as being gentle, 
kind, sometimes even weak in nature. People who never get into any sort of confrontation. Now, Jesus was meek, you know that, right? Yet, he had no problem confronting people in his life. Sometimes he would call religious Pharisees a brood of vipers. These meek meekness, this meekness that Jesus is talking about is actually attached to the blessing of inheriting the earth. Jesus is talking about this uh, has to do with our authority to rule when he comes. So what is this meekness that he's talking about? This is not just about our gentle nature. The best way to translate this word is actually constraint. If you're a meek person, you are, are a person who is constrained. You know how to constrain your anger, your emotion. You know how to constrain your own passions and desires because you represent something or someone greater than yourself. You carry, we all of us as Christians, as children of God, we carry different identity when we are united with Christ. You're not just Aaron. You're not just Douglas. You're not just John or Mark. Each of us, we represent Christ. You know, every time I go out, I have to remind myself, and this is what I tell, tell, tell our kids all the time, that daddy is actually a public figure. Now, I'm, when I say that, I'm not saying that I'm some famous big shot pastor. It's not because of what I do, but it's because of who I represent. Whenever I walk into a mall or a restaurant, when I interact with people on the street, our neighbors, I realize that I represent more than myself. I represent our church body. I represent Jesus Christ. I represent God the Father. That what I say and how I behave all reflect who this God is. It's a scary thought. And I have to remind myself that as I represent Christ, that I have to allow this Holy Spirit to really constrain my own desire, my own uh, freedom, and, and my rights to exercise and, and say whatever I want to do or do whatever I want to I do. And Jesus says this is actually a blessing, to live a life constrained by the power of the Holy Spirit. The fourth blessing says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, how do you hunger and thirst for something? You cannot. You cannot make yourself hungry. You cannot make yourself thirsty. Uh, you just are. You either are hungry and thirsty or you're not. What Jesus is saying here is he's not, again, giving us a rule. He's not telling us do righteous things in your life. That's not what he's saying. But as you grow as a child of God, you begin to develop this longing for righteousness. If you ever get a chance, do a word study on righteousness. You'll be amazed at how many times the, the gospel is actually embedded with this idea. You know, do you realize that the central theme of the gospel is actually not love? Many people will say that the gospel is all about love. In fact, the central theme and the message of the gospel is actually righteousness, what God desires for us. That's why, just in the next chapter, Jesus says, therefore seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's our top pursuit and priority in life as Christians. As we think about this word righteousness, I think most of us understand this word as being free of sin, being innocent. We actually have a very shallow understanding of what this righteousness is. There is a world of difference between being innocent and being righteous. There's this huge gap between not just sinning and being able to do what is actually right. Little children, babies, when they're born, they're innocent. They don't know how to really commit a crime, or I mean, even though that rebellious nature is in them, babies are oftentimes, you know, their idea of righteousness is just being innocent. 
And yet, do you realize that the righteousness that Jesus talks about in the gospel is not just being innocent? It's actually our ability, our power to do what is actually right. It's a sign of maturity that we're able to do the things that require courage, faith, and even sacrifice. This is actually, this longing for righteousness is a sign of being mature in the kingdom of God. You know, as we think about the Pharisees and scribes that Jesus confronted, you know, they were obsessed. They were more concerned about being innocent, being free of sin, not breaking any rules or laws. And yet, the reason why Jesus confronted them so harshly was because they had no idea that the gospel of God was about righteousness. We're not even talking about the righteousness that Jesus just put on us. That's where it begins. You know, theologically, we call it imputed righteousness. We are called righteous by Jesus' sacrifice. But that's not the end of our journey. Our pathway is that we actually grow in our longing for righteousness of God. And there's a change of nature that takes place. So that's the fourth blessing. The fifth, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. Now, again, we use this word mercy very interchangeably with words like compassion. Uh, have, you've heard of expression like mercy ministry. Uh, most people, when you think of mercy, it's going out there and helping the poor. And, and again, uh, this is part of showing mercy, but biblical idea of mercy is not actually an action or a deed. It's an inward attitude, especially attitude towards those who are not worthy of our love. You realize that you can only be merciful to someone who has wronged you. Being merciful is actually so much difficult, more difficult than being meek. Because being meek, meekness just withholds your rights and your, your freedom uh, for the person or for the thing that you represent. But mercy, true mercy requires. Mercy goes further than just being meek. By definition, mercy really means undeserved or unwarranted goodness or kindness. It is going, doing good to those who have actually wronged you. It is choosing not to carry any offenses from those people who have wronged you. Are there people in your life right now, in this past year, people who have offended you, people that you just cannot release. People that you don't want to remember. Ask for heart of mercy. Learn to bless them. Uh, you know, I realize that there are people that I don't want to forgive, but one of the best ways to develop heart of mercy is you actually practice blessing those people. And then the promise is that we also experience God's divine mercy. Just as Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us or our debtors. This is really the foundation of the kingdom of God. The sixth blessing, blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. And again, this is a really hard concept for us to understand. Uh, if I were to ask any children, where's your heart? Where is it? Bethel, where's your heart? Right here, right? We think of our organ, our heart that pumps blood and pumps oxygen. You know, this word heart actually appears in the scripture over 800 times. But not once, it actually refers to our human organ. Nobody actually knows where this heart is. Uh, in Hebrew expression, they said it's in the depth of your belly. But I don't think there's, that, that's actually where our heart is. You know, according to the scriptures in the Bible, heart really refers to our most inmost being, most inner part, inner sanctum of our, our, our being, the most secret part of our consciousness 
the part that only you know, the part that only God can see through. This is really where our heart is. The best way, English way, to translate this word is probably intention or motive. You know that you can do all the good things for the wrong reasons. We can even be in the ministry for the wrong reasons. You can serve God. You can sacrifice your own life even for the wrong reasons. This is why Jesus says just in a couple chapters later that many will come in my name and they will say, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not heal people? Did we not cast out demons? And yet Jesus will say to them, depart from me, you evildoers. Your deeds might be respectable, honorable, but in your heart, you're evil. And he says, I never knew you. It means that in deeds, in action, we can do a lot of good things, and yet what God looks at is not what we've done, what we've accomplished. It's actually the deepest intention and the motives of our heart. And I've known as a nice guy all my life. Uh, even in the seminary, uh, most people will say that he's probably the nice guy uh, that they've known. Uh, but if you really come to know who I am deep inside, in my most conscious, secret part of my being, you'll come to realize that I had this need, need to be loved and to be liked. So all my life, I pursue uh, people's approval, people's attention, people's affection by being a nice person. I've come to realize that I can be a nice person for the wrong reason. It is not... It's not just really who I am, but it's, it's what I want to become for my own need or my own selfishness. And God had to re really break that and, and, and deliver me from that and, and set me free from such bondage. The most important question that we need to ask ourselves today is not what people would think of me today, how they would see me, but how will God, who sees and knows even the most secret and inmost part of my being, think of me. If we have pure intention, the promise of God is that we will see God. You know what the promise really means? It means that we will have his presence. This word, to see God, is a face-to-face -face encounter. It's the expression that was used for Moses. Uh, people who intimately walk with him. The promise is that God will befriend us. He will reveal his face to us. He will sit in front of us, and he will talk as if a friend is talking to us. That's the promise that comes with the purity of heart. The seventh blessing says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This is actually where real ministry begins. This is truly the mature stage of our Christian life. Not only you have peace, but you also become peacemakers. We're not just talking about those with a very diplomatic personality, people who go around recon reconciling people or being nice. He's referring to those who carry the ministry of reconciliation, specifically the reconciliation between God and man. This is actually the greatest ministry, bringing peace between men and God. Many of you are wondering, what is my ministry in life? In 2021, you might be wondering, what ministry should I engage myself with? The greatest ministry that Jesus gives to us, and this is also what Paul reminds us, is this ministry of reconciliation bringing peace, restoring people who are broken, estranged. It is this gospel peace that frees us from all fear and anxiety because we have been reconciled to God who is our Father. Now, we don't have time to go through all these things, but one thing that I want to remind you is that we cannot do this ministry inside the church community. This ministry of reconciliation, this gospel ministry 
is actually ministry that we take to the world. We think of ministry as something that we do in the church community, and yet the greatest ministry that God is calling us to today is this gospel ministry that we have to take it outside of our church community. To those people who live in fear and anxiety, in enmity with God. The last blessing, which we don't want, is actually being persecuted. It's persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted. This Jesus actually considers the ultimate blessedness. He's not saying, if you get persecuted, consider this a blessing. Rather, he's saying that if you live for the kingdom of God, if you live for the righteousness of God, your values, and, and, and your, your values are so radically different from what the world values that you will be hated. You will be persecuted. And this is a blessing in itself. You realize that as we look ahead, look forward, I don't think things are going to get easier for us. I've been saying this all along. If this 2020 has taught us one thing, that God is reminding us and he's actually preparing the church for hardship that's ahead of us. If we truly live by what the, the, uh, the Bible actually commands us and invites us to, we will have to face hardship in the coming days. And Jesus says, this is actually the most blessed way of living your life. Jesus is saying that if things get comfortable, things go easy in life, it could potentially be a sign that we're not actually living for the kingdom that we have fallen back to pursue the things that the world chases after. So to summarize uh, these eight blessings, uh, this is actually a progression. I, I feel like this is really the, the Lord's teaching us that this is how we begin our spiritual journey and this is how we grow in our spiritual maturity. One common theme that runs through this, all of these things, all of these eight sayings is this. It is really about becoming selfless. Now think about what the world promotes in this day and age. It is all about self. The world is obsessed about self. Love yourself. Take care of yourself. Serve yourself. Promote yourself. See, the kingdom of heaven is built up on a very different rule. It is actually for those who become selfless in their journey that they get to inherit the kingdom of God. It's the greatest blessing. And this is really, you know, in Hebrew, the word blessed is the same as happy. You want to be happy in this life. The pathway is that we become selfless in our pursuit. This is really the way Jesus lived his life. Remember? He begins his ministry, his public life, with 40 days of fasting abstaining from the things that is rightfully his. Jesus is the one who wept over the city of Jerusalem. He was meek and humble. He showed us what the righteousness of God was really like. His life was really the embodiment of God's mercy. Even the ones who were crucifying him, he pleaded for God's mercy, the Father's mercy. He did not care for what others might think of him, but his intention was always pure. He is our peacemaker who brought us, who reconciled us to God the Father. And then think about where his life ended, on the cross, giving himself, receiving the hatred of the world, but more than that, he became the object of God's hatred for our sake. This is the most blessed way of life. The blessing that I want to speak over you today, the eight blessings, is really taking after the heart and the character of our Savior, the most selfless person who showed us the way of the kingdom. I don't know what goals you have set for 2021. What resolutions have you made? 
this is really a worthy goal for us. This is a worthy resolution. This is also the way God wants to bless his children. Even as we take communion today, uh, it's really fitting that we open this very first Sunday reminding ourselves that we are in union with our Savior, Christ, that we are called, we are invited to partake in his divine nature. You know, this communion, even though we don't get to practice together as a, as a whole body, is probably one of the most sacred acts as God's children, that whenever we break the body of Christ and whenever we drink from his cup, this very language that Jesus used is a marriage language. He's inviting us. Marriage is probably one of the most intimate union that human beings can experience, and God is inviting us to enter into this intimate oneness with him. And as we do that, we're partaking. We're taking after God's own nature. So will you take a moment before we uh, break the bread and, and we take the cup? If you haven't prepared yet, uh, just take a few moments to go and uh, prepare a loaf of bread. And let's enter into this sacred table. When you're ready, let's take the bread. This act of breaking, being broken, is probably one of the, the most beautiful demonstration or display of selflessness. Who wants to live a life of brokenness? And yet Jesus is reminding us that this is really the invitation. The happiest way to live your life is to be broken to break your life for others, to give away. So let's make a fresh commitment that as we enter into this beautiful union with Christ, this may be a bold statement, but let's say, Lord, will you break me this year so that my life can be a blessing, that people would find life and peace and righteousness through my own brokenness. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. This cup is his new covenant with us. The covenant of union that as we partake in this, Jesus is reminding us that we have been united with him not just in body, but in our spirit. Let's dip it and partake it together. Will you join me in prayer? a blessing over us, over our church, over our family. You've been reminding us that, Lord, we are not made for this world. This is not our kingdom. This is not, not our final destination. Father, thank you for calling us to be the inheritor of the recipients of your kingdom. And Lord, with that, we receive this blessing of being poor in this life, having a thirst and hunger for your righteousness, carrying your godly sorrows in this life, being meek, living a life constrained by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to partake in your divine mercy. We want to extend release and forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Lord, we pray for 
the purity of our most inmost being, the part that you only see, that in life we'll have purest intention in all our acts and doings. Lord, may we become peacemakers in this world. Commission us once again as we launch out into 2021 that wherever you send us, Lord, that we will be the reconcilers of men and God. And Lord, when persecution comes, Lord, we gladly receive and rejoice as this is the way of the blessed. Help us not to live to avoid suffering, but in the midst of suffering, Lord, that we will gladly serve you. We'll gladly rejoice. For the kingdom of God belongs to those. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
yours Oh fear removed I breathe you in I lean into your love Oh your love So Father, we turn to you in 2021 provided so many blessings for us in 2020 in the past year. I pray that we look to you in this upcoming year that we can have faith and hope that the blessings that you have in store for us will be enough for us. That we can set aside our worldly desires and all the goals that we have and we can turn to you for wisdom and to see what plans that you have for us. Thank you so much for 2020 and thank you so much for 2021. We love you, Father. And then we pray. Amen. We done. Are we done? Good job, everyone. Thank you.